So this talk is about how past changes in climate might have affected biodiversity. And it's uh, useful to look at this because it's by looking into the past that we might get an idea about how future climate change might itself affect biodiversity. The first point to be made is that climate change is certainly nothing new. And we now know that uh, because of the way that the Earth orbits the Sun and um, aspects of that orbit, such as the tilt of the Earth relative to the Sun and the um, obliquity and eccentricity of its orbit, various amounts of radiation may impinge on the Earth's atmosphere. And it appears that these rather long cycles of change in orbit, which uh, have periods of, of tens to hundreds of thousands of years, affect in a very dramatic way the Earth's climate. This slide shows how the Earth's atmospheric composition and its temperature have been changing over the last half a million years, 500,000 years. The x-axis, which runs from the past on the left-hand side to the present on the right-hand side, um, reveals that we currently live in an unusually stable climatic period. If you look at the temperature graph, which is in blue, you'll see that the last 10,000 years or so have um, been a fairly stable uh, have been fairly stable in terms of temperature. Going back in time, one can see the changes, uh, fairly marked but pulsed changes in atmospheric CO2, methane and temperature in relation to the changes in the energy of the sun, the black line on the top. The main point is that for the last half million years, the Earth's climate has been a lot colder than it is currently. We have this kind of information at a very fine spatial scale from ice cores that have been drilled deep into the polar caps in the North and South Pole. This is possibly one of the most famous ice core drilling stations there is. It's called Vostok. On the left-hand side, you can see the layout of the drilling station. And on the right-hand side, you can see a core that has been pulled up out of the ice, the uh, tube of ice lying down on its side. And uh, what the scientists do is to slice small slices out of this tube to melt them and then when they uh, when the ice is melted it releases air that has been trapped in the original ice in tiny bubbles that were formed when the original snow fell which formed that ice. But there are other ways to reconstruct past climates as is summarized in this paper here represented on the slide. In the panel on the top right hand side you'll see records for tree ring width growth, uh, which has been summarized for very ancient trees, sampled in the points on the globe, summarized in the bottom left-hand panel. And these ancient records show how trees grew much faster about a thousand years ago, a period called the medieval warm period, and grew much more slowly about 500 years ago during a period called the Little Ice Age. And th the value of these long-term records becomes really apparent when one compares what humans have done to the atmospheric CO2 composition, for example, in relation to what has been going on for the last half million years. And as you can see, if you look at the blue line in this graph, the human impact is virtually a vertical line. The impact of humans has been very dramatic and very rapid on the atmospheric CO2 composition. And it's now much higher than it's been for at least the last half million years, and possibly higher than it's been for the last eight million years. Of course, the big question is, how might these rather rapid changes in atmosphere and possible changes in climate affect biodiversity into the future? One thing we learn from looking at these records is that migration has almost certainly been one of the key processes which has allowed ecosystems to adapt to change in the past. And as you can see from the yellow arrows on the side of this graph, there have been periods during the Earth's history when change has been fairly rapid, and those are areas that we would like to go and look at to see how vegetation might have responded, because those are where we're going to get the clues to how vegetation might respond in future. To give you an idea of how different the world looked um, as little as 18,000 years ago during a period called the last glacial maximum, this map shows, the, for example, the extent of ice fields and glaciers in the northern hemisphere, which are in dark blue and in uh, dark green. Very, very clearly, this is a very different world. For example, if you look at the tropics, 
you see the tropical forests are much re- reduced in extent. And in fact, much of the tropics was grassland and savanna vegetation and not tropical forest. These are clearly very, very dramatic differences between the past as little as 18,000 years ago and the present. And uh, very clearly things have changed very rapidly for as little, uh, a smaller change as five degrees cooler than currently. At Sandby in Cape Town, we've been particularly interested in how two vegetation biomes, the fire-prone Cape Floristic region, or the Fenbos biome, and the drought-prone succulent Karoo, may have responded to these changes over the last 18,000 years ago, as an indication of how changes might have been continuing over the last two million years or so. Now, this is a particularly powerful piece of work published in Science fairly recently, which shows the response of two species, a spruce and oak, to these past changes from about 20,000 years ago to the present, in other words, from the last glacial maximum until the present. And as you can very clearly see, as the ice sheet retreated in North America, represented by the light blue, both of these species shifted their distributions very much further north than they used to exist. And clearly this reveals the very important role of migration in allowing these species to adapt to climate change and keep pace with the sorts of climates which suited their physiologies. In fact, it's even possible that the current distribution of biodiversity hotspots around the world may even reflect the imprint of those past changes. This is a very interesting aspect of the Earth's pattern of vegetation distribution. Is it possible that when we look at current hotspots of biodiversity, we're seeing a reflection of past climate change. The Western Cape is a winter rainfall region, and this slide merely illustrates the advance of a cold front which has been born on the westerly systems, which bring rains to the Western Cape region during winter months. We were interested to see how much temperatures might have differed between the present and the past, the LGM, last glacial maximum, And using general circulation model results, we discovered that 18,000 years ago, temperatures may have been as little as 3.7 degrees cooler than they are currently. We also have some idea of how the westerlies, which bear rain-bearing fronts, may have shifted in latitude during during the past, and the last glacial maximum in particular, looks as though these rain-bearing fronts shifted roughly two and a half degrees in latitude further north. In other words, bringing much more rain more frequently to this part of the world. We decided to look at how these climate changes might have impacted on vegetation types by using a simple model method called climate space modeling. Some people call it bioclimatic modeling or niche-based modeling. And quite straightforwardly, um, what one does is to correlate the current distribution of your biome or species represented by the panel on the top left with aspects of uh, the climate, such as maximum temperature. And using this correlation in a GIS framework, we can then construct what we call a, a performance envelope for the species or the biome of interest. That then allows the, uh, the movement of the biome in response to climate change to be mapped onto a special, in a special framework. This map just reveals the efficiency of this modeling method with respect to modeling the Feinbos biome and uh, shows simply where the model is correct in blue and where the model over predicts and under predicts relative to where the biome actually occurs. And this model is very, very straightforward and uses simple aspects of climate such as mean annual rainfall, minimum temperature, the coldest month, an index of water balance, and the proportion of winter rain. So a very, very straightforward way of, of constructing a model like this. And we did the same thing for the succulent Karoo biome and got a very similar level of performance from the modeling method. When one uses those modeling outputs and applies them to what the climate might have been doing over the last 18,000 years ago, represented by the numbers in dark red going from the present at the bottom left to 18,000 years ago on the top right, one sees that given the climate changes, the temperature and rainfall changes, 
one might have expected a very, very different distribution of both fanbos and succulent karoo, with climatic conditions suitable for fanbos existing much further up the west coast of this area, and succulent karoo existing in much smaller areas during the LGM. Then as climate warmed and dried, so fanbos uh, conditions would have retreated, and conditions for succulent karoo would have become much more spatially widespread. Although we don't have an enormous amount of evidence to support models like this, there is a little bit of evidence, one of which is from pollen extracted from seabed cores taken off the west coast of Namibia. And what this shows is that for an area outlined by the black number one in the top right panel, two key elements of the fanbos, the Restionaceae and Ericaceae, two key families, have pollen that was quite well represented about 18,000 years ago, as you can see by the light blue and dark blue lines in the graph on the bottom right. And then about 15,000 years ago, this fossil pollen disappears from the core, indicating the retreat of fanbos from that area. And uh, the model suggests that that was replaced by the red of the succulent karoo. Another way to judge the effectiveness of the model is to compare the current areas of endemism, areas where many species of endemic families occur along the west coast of this part of the world, and the areas which 18,000 years ago, if you look at the right-hand panel, are defined as being supportive of succulent karoo, even during the depths of the last glacial maximum. This indicates, again, that an area which retained the bioclimate suitable for succulent karoo also retained the highest level of plant species richness. So climate stability tends to allow species richness to accumulate. And as this slide shows, one of the particular areas of species richness, the Knaas Flakta Plain along the west coast, is a particularly warm, dry plain, which even during the LGM, the last glacial maximum, with, higher temp with lower temperatures and higher rainfall, would have retained its desert-like character. What's particularly interesting about the succulent crew is that it appears to have evolved huge numbers of species in particular groups which are adapted to the semi-arid conditions of this biome. And this evolution appears to have occurred very recently in time, possibly even during the Pleistocene, the periods during which temperatures were a lot cooler than they are currently. This slide shows a cladogram extracted from the paper in the previous slide, revealing rapid speciation, which has probably occurred in the last two or three million years, in one particular group represented by the slides uh, of the plant species on the, on the left-hand side. The form of modelling I've been talking about does not take into account if direct effects of things such as changes in atmospheric CO2. Clearly, there are some species or functional types, plant functional types, for which the CO2 changes will be significant. This needs another method for um, making predictions. One of these methods is called mechanistic modeling. And I'll illustrate this with an, an example from savannas, looking at the interactions of atmospheric CO2 and fire. Mechanistic models such as this combine a knowledge of the physiology and biophysics which govern plant growth, the physics of water and nutrient fluxes in the soil, um, aspects of plant structure and phenology, the timing of their growth, which then affect vegetation dynamics. And models such as this also can incorporate the effects of disturbance by, for example, fire. So these models are, are able to incorporate the direct effects of climate <clears throat> and the fertilizing effects of CO2 on plant growth and extrapolate that to vegetation dynamics. Models such as this do a fairly good job of converting a basic understanding of climate, climate inputs, into the kinds of structure and function that one would expect from vegetation. And this slide represents a map produced by such a model, a dynamic vegetation model, which reveals a fairly good representation of what we know the world looks like, but based purely on a biophysical understanding of plant growth. 
One of these models, the Sheffield Dynamic Global Vegetation Model, developed by Professor Ian Woodward at Sheffield, has been fairly extensively tested on South African vegetation. And this slide gives an example of what the model predicts vegetation should look at, should look like, compared with the actual vegetation as photographed on the particular site that has been modelled. It's even possible to ask interesting questions of a model like this. For example, one can ask the question, what would the world look like if there were no such thing as fire, disturbance by fire? Would that have any effect on the world's vegetation types? And the answer to that question appears to be a resounding yes. For we see that if we model what the world looks like without fire, we can see quite clearly that many parts of the world which are currently dominated by grasslands, C4 grasslands, would be taken over by trees and forests if fire were excluded. And indeed, there are many experiments around the world where fire has been excluded and trees are shown to be much more successful. Therefore, climate is not the only thing that directly controls vegetation structure. Disturbance also is a very important control and can override the effects of climate. This slide shows quite eloquently how where the model predicts fires are important for vegetation structure is in fact the main parts of the world in which fire does occur as revealed by independent um, observation of fire frequency from satellites as shown in the, in the map on the right hand side. One aspect we've been particularly interested to test is the effect of CO2 on woody plants, trees, because we know that trees need a lot of carbon to build their structures, such as trunks and branches, while grasses do not need as much carbon to do so. And analysing the past changes in vegetation, we see that during periods of low CO2, grasses were much more successful. During periods of high CO2, trees became much more successful. This is clearly an important aspect for future changes in CO2, and we decided to use both modelling and experiments to test this idea. Our simple hypothesis was that low CO2 is likely to limit tree growth relatively more than it limits the growth of herbaceous plants. The result of this is that during periods of low CO2, grasses would have been able to grow just as fast as they do now under high CO2 levels but trees would have, been able, would have been forced to grow much more slowly. What this allows is for grasses to build up enough biomass to burn the young tree saplings which are trying to grow through the grass layer and establish themselves into adult trees. We summarise this hypothesis with this graph showing how the escape of tree saplings to what we call escape height, which is above the lethal flame zone, of grass fueled fires would have been much slower under low CO2 than it would be now under high CO2 and possibly into the future. What are the implications of this hypothesis? Well, there are two very important ones. Firstly, we would expect to see a contraction of trees during low CO2 periods, and we should be able to pick that up in the pollen record. And we should have seen the encroachment of trees since the pre-industrial era when humans started to pump much more CO2 into the atmosphere. There we can use empirical experiments and observations to test the idea. This series of maps shows what we would expect for an index of tree cover, the leaf area index, which shows very low tree cover over the central part of southern Africa during the last glacial maximum on the top left. A strong increase in tree cover, and in the future, under 700 ppm, a level that is, is expected by 2100, a very considerable increase in tree growth. These are simulations run solely by changing CO2 without any changes in climate whatsoever, showing the very dominant effect of CO2 on vegetation structure. And if one looks at the pollen record for this particular area, looked at in the previous slide, one can see going back in time to 24,000 to 14,000 years ago, the period of the last glacial maximum, very low amounts of savanna tree pollen. But as one comes into the present, after about 9,000 years before present, when CO2 levels rose up, tree pollen becomes much more common, much more evident.
We've also tested this idea by growing trees under different CO2 levels under greenhouse conditions and compared the results that we find in yellow with the results that are projected by the Sheffield Dynamic Global Vegetation Model in red. And what it shows is that the model, based on its first principles understanding, represents very well the relative impact of CO2 on savanna tree growth. What this implies is that low CO2 discriminates strongly against woody plants, but has no effect on herbaceous plants, as we've also shown in our experiments. Clearly then, increasing atmospheric CO2 has very direct effects on tree growth, which is likely to translate into very significant changes in uh, vegetation structure in areas which are controlled by the balance, the competitive balance between trees and grasses and controlled by fire. And it looks like the main reason for this big response of trees to carbon is that they're able to store carbon in their root systems below ground under high CO2 much more effectively than they are under low CO2 conditions. This store of carbon is what allows tree, trees to recover from injury, such as from fire and from grazing, and become much more dominant under high CO2 conditions. This is not the only thing that changes. We also find that CO2 controls the carbon investment in things such as thorns and in other forms of defences, such as tannins. Therefore, our overall conclusion is that woody plants and trees would be not only better defended against damage, but also better defended against herbivory, so better defended against both fire and herbivores in, into the future as CO2 continues to rise. We now think that this response of trees to atmospheric CO2 could well be one of the important reasons behind the worldwide increases in woody plants that one sees in areas where previously grasslands or open savannas as revealed by this change in vegetation structure in this match photograph. A number of conclusions flow from all this work, first of which is that climate and CO2 have definitely changed in the past, sometimes very rapidly, but for the past two million years this change has been fairly strictly bounded. We can conclude that species have tended to migrate to track past changes, though there is occasional evidence of adaptation this is probably not relevant for a future conservation context. Furthermore, it's not only climate, but both CO2 and fire and other potential changes that can affect biodiversity. This means that how we manage vegetation also matters. It's not only, we are not only slaves to the effects of climate. Most importantly, we probably need to view all biological response models with some level of skepticism, taking into account the major assumptions and uncertainties incorporated within them, but certainly they are very important tools to project the effects of climate change into the future.